Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. This is uh, Thomas Carlyle's uh, Sartre Resortas and on heroes and hero worship. Uh, he was born in 1795 on uh, 4th of December and he died on in 1881 on this 4th of February. Uh, this uh, book is Sartre's Resortus, of course, is a great book, but we want to come to uh, heroes and hero worship. Uh, these are lectures he gave in England, London, on in, in 1940. There are there are six of these letters, <coughs> and we will talk about them. And the um, first one is about uh, hero as a divinity, uh, Odin, and it talks about paganism and Scandin Scandinavian mythology. And in the second lecture, he talks about uh, hero as prophet, and he chooses Muhammad sallallahu and he writes Mahomat. <laughs> of course, we don't spell it like this, and Islam he picks up. Muhammad and Islam uh, as hero, as prophet. And then third one, third lecture, he gave one hero as a poet and he picked up Dante and Shakespeare. And uh, fourth lecture, hero as a priest. He took, talk, talked about Luther uh, in his reformation and uh, Knox and um, Puritanism. And then in fifth lecture, he talked about hero as a man of letters, and he talked about uh, uh, Samuel Johnson and Rousseau and Burns. And in the sixth lecture, he talked about hero as King and Cromwell and Napoleon and uh, modern uh, revolutions. And of course, now he could talk about hero as uh, sportsman and such and such and such and such and such and such. Yeah, but uh, we want to talk about <coughs> why, why he goes to uh, hero as hero as hero worship. He, he gave these lectures um, in May 1840. Uh, the first lecture he gave on hero as divinity on the 5th of May. And the second lecture, he's a hero as prophet. And Muhammad, he gave on Friday, 8th of May, 1840. And um, third lecture, hero as poet. And he talked about Dante and Shakespeare uh, on Tuesday, 12th of May, 1800. And um, uh, hero as priest, Luther and Reformation, and Knox and Puritanism. He talked on Friday, 15th. Uh, of May 1840, and then hero as a man of letters. He talked about Johnson and Rousseau and Burns, and on tu this was on Tuesday, 19th of May 1840, and uh, hero is King. Uh, he talked about Cromwell, of course, and Napoleon, and uh, the modern revolutions, and of course this was 180 years ago, so. Uh, for, he talked about these things on Friday, 22nd of May, 1840, and many more heroes have been born and they have died ever since. But coming to uh, 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 this lecture on uh, Hero as Prophet, before we talk about um, his lecture, we, talk, we can talk about Thomas Carlyle himself. He was born on 4th of uh, December, uh, 1795, at uh, Eclifim, 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 uh, in uh, Dumf Dumfries or Dumfries Shire. His father was a, a stone mason, a stone mason. Thomas received his early education in Annan Academy and went to Edinburgh University. He worked as a schoolmaster for a short period of time, from 1814 to 1818, 
but decided on a literary career, visiting Paris and London, and he married Joan Bailey Welsh on 17th of October 1826 and settled in Edinburgh. And finally, at number five, um, Shan Rowe, Chelsea, where he died on 4th of February 1840, 1881. And some of his famous works are, of course, Sartre, Resortus, um, and other things, and many, many, many more things. But we can just pass them by French Revolution. He talks lectures on history of literature and uh, critical miscellaneous essays and heroes and hero worship lectures he published in 1840, 18, published in 1841, and past and present, of course, famous book, and Oliver Cromwell's letters and speeches in 1845, and many other works of great repute. Uh, as we talked about these um, lectures, uh, the second lecture on heroes and hero worship, now we want to read. First one is about Odin and the Scandinavian mythology, and of course man became God, and of course this went on to Jesus becoming God with Paul and other people, and so uh, he says man becoming God is past, is gone, and prophet also at, at some stage he says Muhammad sallallahu is the last prophet, he mentions it, and he says no other prophet will be recognized after this, even this Thomas, Thomas Carlyle says this in his this lecture. Uh, but of course there are some people who want, you know, many people to be born as prophets and um, Babi and Baha'i, they promoted in Iran um, from Isna Ashari's of Muslim Muslims, Shias, and from Sunnis, they projected uh, Qadiani Ahmad, Ghulam Ahmad um, in, in, in India and what uh, is Pakistan and India now. So anyway, um, the, he says last prophet was Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and <clears throat> uh, now from the first rude times of paganism, he says, among the Scandinavian in the north, we advanced to a very different epoch of religion among a very different people. Uh, Muhammadanism, he says, of course we, we, we say we are Muslims, not Muhammadanists. Uh, among the Arabs, a great change. Of course, uh, um, it's not only Arabs who are Muslims, Indonesians are more, Bengalis and uh, Indians and uh, all over the world, of Afghanis and whatever. They are not only Arabs who are Muslims, more, more other non-Arabs uh, than Muslims. A great change, what a change, he says, and progress is indi indicated here in the universal condition and thoughts of man. Of course, Thomas Carlyle resisted some of the uh, people who were talking against Muhammad Sallallahu during his time, 180 years ago, in 1840s. People, there were many, many people like Macaroni and Rushdi and Bush and Blair who were talking against Islam at that time and against Muhammad Sallallahu Charlie Hebdo people were you know, talking during those times. And this man, he had the honor and the dignity to come up and he says, no, we must, <coughs> we must not <coughs> malign this great man. So he says, the hero is not now regarded as a god among his fellow men, but as one god inspired, Vahi Yuhaide, as a prophet, it's revealed from God. It is the second phases, he says, of hero worship. The first or oldest, we may say, has passed away, he says, without return, which means now, as, as he explains later on, uh, in the history of the world, there will not again be any man never so great whom his fellow men will take for a god. Nay, he says, we might rationally ask, did any set of human beings ever really think the man um, they saw there standing beside them a god, the maker of this world? <laughs> So many people are born even today in India whom they consider gods and Hirohito is still and his descendants they are considered gods but of course they go to the toilet 
and they eat and they drink. So no, this is not uh, a nice thing for a god to do. Perhaps not. It was usually some man they remembered or had seen. But neither can this may any more be. The great man is not recognized henceforth as a god any more, he says. Okay, let us <clears throat> accept it as he says. It was a rude, gross error, he says, that of counting the great man a god. Yet let us say that it is at all times difficult to know what he is or how to account of him and receive him. The most, in, most, most significant feature in the history of uh, an epoch is the manner it has of welcoming a great man. Today they are welcoming either Trump as God or Biden as God to save America. Today, even today, this 4th or 5th of uh, uh, November 2020. Uh, so even today they have not decided, they are still counting the vote. Ever to the true instincts of man, there's something godlike in him, in Biden or Trump, which one? Whatever they shall take him to be a god, to be a prophet, or what they shall take him to be, take him, Trump to be God, or bidden to be God to save them. That is ever a grand question, he says, Carlyle, 180 years ago. Uh, I'm putting the names of Trump and Biden, and, and of course you can put uh, Imran and whatever, other people, Modi of uh, our times. Uh, uh, I says whether they shall take him to be a god, to be a prophet, or what they shall take him to be, that is ever a grand question. By their way of answering that, we shall see as though a little window into the very heart of these men's spiritual condition. For at bottom, the great man, as he comes from the hand of nature, is ever the same kind of thing, he says. Odin, well, he says Odin was a man, a great man, of course. Luther, he says, was a great man. Johnson, he says, Burns, they were great men. I hope, he says, I hope to make it appear that these are all originally of one stuff, that only by the world's reception of them and the shapes they assume are they so immeasurably diverse. The worship of Odin astonishes us, he says, to all prostrate before the great man into deliquium of love and wonder over him and feel in their hearts that he was a denizen of the skies of God. And this was imperfect enough. This was imperfect enough. But to welcome, for example, a Burns, as we did, as we, that is British people did, was that what we can call perfect. Burns was Robert Burns, the great poet. The most precious gift that heaven can give to the earth, a man of genius, he says, as we call it, the soul of a man actually sent down from the skies with a God's message to us, the British at that time. This we waste away as an idle artificial firework sent to amuse us a little and sink it into ashes, wreck and ineffectually. Such a reception of a great man I do not call very perfect either. Looking into the heart of the thing, one may perhaps call that and of Burns, a still uglier phenomenon, betokening still sadder imperfections in mankind's ways than the Scandinavian method itself, to fall into their mere unreasoning deliquium of love and admiration was not good, but such unreasoning may, may irrational supercilious, no love at all, is perhaps still worse. It is a thing 
forever changing, he says, this of hero worship, different in each age, difficult to do well in any age. Indeed, the heart of the whole business of the age, one may say, is to do it well. Now the heroes, God heroes, hero gods are are these football men and cricket men and who are ruling the world and even today somebody is going to be uh, uh, elected in Africa who is a sportsman. He qualifies, Carl, Carl, Thomas Carlyle gives his justification for choosing Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa peace be upon him as a hero for this subject. He says, we have chosen Muhammad Muhammad, not as the most eminent, he says, prophet, most, not as the most eminent prophet, he says. Of course, we consider him to be the most important, but for Thomas Carlyle, he was not the most eminent prophet, but as the one we are freest to speak of, he says, he is by no means the truest of prophets. He is by no means the truest of prophets, he says, but I do esteem him a little one. Uh, uh, but I do esteem him a true one. Further, as there is no danger of our becoming any of us Mohammedans, our means the British 100 year, 180 years ago, now many, many, many British have accepted Islam. Yusuf Islam is one of them, Yusuf Hamza and all these people, Muslims, Alhamdulillah. But he says, of course, I do esteem him a true one, for the, as there is no danger, of course, the danger. That's why these people, Macron, Macaroni and other people are talking against Muhammad Wasallam. But that danger makes him more eminent. Alhamdulillah, he says, I mean to say, all the good of him I justly can. All the good, he says, that I justly can say about him. It is the way to get at the, his secret. Let us try to understand what he meant with the world, what the world meant and means with him will then be a more answerable question. Carlyle refused Christian hypothesis about Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam about his being um, in you know false in falsehood incarnate etc. imposter and scheming. So he says our current hypothesis our our means British and of course European and are not leaving beside the American even the Trump and Biden perhaps including. Our current hypothesis, he says, about Muhammad, that he was a scheming imposter, a falsehood incarnate, that his religion is a mere mass of quackery and fatuity, begins really to be now untenable to anyone. Untenable, he says, now, now, 180 years ago, but the Europeans who are uh, who hate Muhammad وسلم, even today, 180 years by now, still go on Macaroni and Bush and Blair and Trump. You know, but but let Thomas Carlyle speak for himself. He says Carlyle speaks of the lies heaped around, heap round Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He says the lies which well-meaning zeal, zeal, he says, which was well-meaning, <laughs> uh, has heaped round this man, are disgraceful to ourselves only. He says, the lies which well-meaning zeal has heaped round this man, are disgraceful to ourselves only. When Pocock, of course, and inquired of Grotius where the proof was of that story of the pigeon trained to pick peas from Muhammad Sallallahu ear and uh, pass for an angel dictating to him. Grotius answered that there was no proof. It is really time to dismiss all, all that.
the Fijian thing. And of course, Gibbon talks about this, and I, I don't have to read this. Uh, these 180 million people, he says, these 180 million, even 180 years ago, and even today, the Europeans and even Muslims are shy of t talking about two billions. They say 180 million, even today, 180 years after this. But this was Thomas Carlyle. He wrote, these 180 millions of Muslims were made by God as well as we. We means Christians, Europeans, white men, superman, white superiority man, this man who killed 50 pers 51 people even in New Zealand. So they, they, all these people who, whom they killed, they were also made by the same God as these 180 million people, Muslims people, are, were created by God. This is what he says, these 180 millions were made, made means created by God as well as we, we Christians, we Europeans, we Americans, we white men, we, Thomas Carlyle said 180 years ago, a greater number of God's creatures believe in Muhammad's word at this hour. 180 years ago, but today there are more than two billions. Uh, why aren't they not talking about more than two billions? A greater number of God's creatures believe in Muhammad's word at this hour than in any other word, whatever. Are we to suppose, he says, are we to suppose that it was a miserable piece of a spiritual legardian? This which so many creatures of the Almighty have lived by and died by. Ah, he says, I for my part cannot form any such supposition. He says, I for my part cannot form any such supposition. I will believe most things sooner. These are my notes I have put down here. The, I, I, I for my part, he says, I for my part, uh, is, is a hollow. Uh, I believe most things sooner, sooner, so I believe sooner than that one would be entirely at a loss what to think of this world at all if quackery, quackery so grew and were sanctioned here. Now, such lamentable theories indicate the saddest spiritual paralysis. This is what um, uh, saddest spiritual paralysis, Thomas Carlyle, 180 years ago. He says, such lamentable theories, alas, such theories are very lamentable. If we would attain to knowledge of anything in God's true creation, let us disbelieve them wholly. They are the product of an age of skepticism. They indicate the saddest spiritual paralysis and mere death life of the souls of men. More godless theory, I think, was never promulgated in, the, on, in this earth, he says, 180 years ago. A false man found a religion? Why, a false man cannot build a brick house if he do not know and follow truly the properties of mortar and burnt clay and what else he works in. It is no house that he makes but a rubbish heap. It will not stand for 12 centuries. Now it's 15 centuries. 15th century is going on. It would not stand. It was not stand for 12 centuries, he said, 180 years ago. It would not stand 15 centuries to lodge a 180 million, 180 million, 180 years ago. How many billions now? It, they are not procreating Muslims, uh, it will fall straight away. Such a house built by a foolish man, a, a wrong man, would fall straight away. A man must conform himself to nature's laws. He 
we, we, in, we verily in communion with nature and the truth of things or nature will answer him, no, not at all. Speciosities or species, oh, me, a coliostro, many a coliostros. There are meanings, of, I put down notes here. Prominent world leaders do prosper by their quackery. Prominent world leaders like Trump, like Bickett Bitten, like Bush and Blair, they can prosper by their quackery for a day, for four years, maybe. It is like a forged bank note. They get it passed out of their worthless hands. Others, not they, have to smart it for, smart for it. Nature bursts up in fire frames. French revolutions and such like, proclaiming with terrible veracity that forged notes are forged. He says, a great man cannot be anything but true and sincere and original. This is what he is going to say. And let us see, we have took 16 minutes now, so 26 minutes. But he says, but Thomas Carlyle says, but of a great man especially, of him, of Muhammad Sallallahu of him I will venture to assert that it is incredible he should have been other than true. But of a great man, especially of him, him, that is Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Muhammad, of him I will venture to assert that it is incredible he should have been other than true. It is, it seems to me, the primary foundation of him of, and of all that can lie at him, this, no, no Mirabu, no Napoleon, no Burns, Cromwell, no man is adequate to do anything, but is first of all in right earnest about it, what I call a sincere man, a class, khulus. I should say sincere, sincerity, a deep, great, genuine sincerity uh, is the first characteristic of all men in any way heroic. Not the sincerity that calls itself sincere, not Trump's sincerity, not Bush's sincerity, not Blair's sincerity. Ah, no, that is a very poor matter indeed. A shadow braggart conscious sincerity, often, oftenest self conceit, manly self conceit, Bush and Blair and Trump and Biden. The great man's sincerity is of the kind he cannot speak of. Macron's sincerity? No. The great man's sincerity is of the kind he cannot speak of, is not conscious of. Nay, I suppose. Thomas Carlyle says, he supposes, I suppose, he is conscious rather of insincerity. For what man can walk accurately by the law of truth for one day? No, the great man does not boast himself of sincerity. Far from that, perhaps does not ask himself if he is sincere, if he is so. I would say rather his sincerity does not depend on himself. He cannot help being sincere. The great fact of existence is great to him. Fly as he will. He cannot get out of the awful presence of this reality of existence, Zindagi, life. The great fact of existence is great to him. Fly as he will. He cannot get out of the awful presence of this reality. His mind is so made, he is great by that. First of all, fearful and wonderful. Taqwa, Parhezgari, Yitqaf, Waman Khaf, Maqam Rabbihi, Jannatan. Fearful and wonderful, awestruck, real as life, real as death is this universe to him. Though all men should forget its truth, 
man walk in a vain show? He cannot. Muhammad cannot. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. At all moments, the flame image glares in upon him. Undeniable there. There. I wish you to say, Noor glare. Noor. Which, um, John. John, what's his name? Pendar. John found the Noor at all moments. And, and Robertson, Charlie. At all moments, the flame image glares in upon him. Undeniable there. There, there, the Noor. There, the glare. There, the shining glare. I wish you to take it. This as my primary definition of a great man. A little man may have this. It is competent to all men that God has made. But a great man cannot be without this noor, without this glare, without this. Inshallah, we take a break here and we will read further on next time. Muhammad, an original man. What he says about Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, Thomas Carlyle, make Allah have peace upon him and may him may accept his effort. And many many Muslims today appreciate the work he has done. But of course, in quotations, so assalamu alaikum warahmatullah barakatu. Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Sayyidina Muhammad Nabiyyul Ummi wa alaihi wa sabi wa zwaji wa zuriyati wa albaati ajma'in. Bi rahmatika ya. الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين